Hey there, welcome to the Snakebird Podcast. My name's Josh. And I'm Steve. Together we invite you to join us as we explore the mysteries of Scripture, the realm of God, and freedom through Christ. So spread out your wings and slither in place because this is is Snakebird. Hey, welcome listeners to another episode of the Snakebird podcast. We're just a couple of weeks away from Easter Sunday and we've decided to dedicate the next few episodes of the podcast to solely focus on Jesus and his finished work on the cross. In today's podcast, we want to take a moment to focus on the final events before the cross and lay out some of the things that Jesus went through and did. Yeah, you know, many of us have heard the story of Jesus' path to the cross, and it's important that we revisit this event from time to time because so much of what we believe is based on that sacrifice and the road that led to it. So as we sift through these events in our episode today, we would encourage you to reflect on what God is calling you to do now because of what he did then. Yeah, I couldn't have said it any better because we don't want to come away with any holes in what Jesus went through or what he did. And and to, to kind of come in um, at the week before, you find the flavor of Jerusalem even so different than what it is uh, just six days later. That's true. There's a lot of anticipation in um, the whole region because of what Jesus has been doing and the timelines, you know, ticking down. The hourglass is falling. Yeah, I would say not just only anticipation, but a lot of expectation of what the Jewish people are thinking Jesus is going to establish or what he's going to bring with him. So why don't you set the scene and let us know kind of what's going on during this final week? Yeah. So, Six days before Passover, Jesus arrives in Bethany, and most will recall this scene where Mary anoints Jesus' feet with that expensive perfume, and the disciples kind of look at him sideways for that one in particular, but Jesus makes that prophetic statement that Mary is anointing his body for burial. So Jesus is starting at this point to give clear signs of his coming sacrifice. He's starting to really, you know, bring to fruition this this anticipation and everything starting even six days before. And I mean, it ramps up quite a bit even the next day, which is Sunday, which I mean, that's Palm Sunday. Yeah. That's a that's a very well known. Well, and he's already been foreshadowing it. Just they're not really getting it. That's true. Yeah, but it, it's starting to to come um, even quicker now. Now that the cross is just six days away. Yeah. Little do they know. So Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, known as you know the triumphal entry, and it it really is a triumphal entry. He's fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah nine nine. And the people, they can they can tell what's going on because they start chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Save now. Yeah. And you can just imagine the picture as he's riding in. I, I just picture people on, you know, like castle walls looking down, just chanting. I don't know yeah. if that's how it looked. I'm not sure. But, but yeah. laying down their clothes, laying down palm fronds. Exactly. And it's in a it's quite a um, a scene to picture, but basically um, they're recognizing Jesus as the Messiah that they thought was going to overthrow the Roman government. Mm-hmm. That's who they thought was coming into the city gates. Yeah, and it is but wrong timing on that part. But the you know the crazy thing is what this same crowd starts chanting in the days to come, and we'll get to that. Yeah. But um, this this crowd they're chanting, you know, Hosanna! This is the Messiah they're expecting. It's quite a scene to to picture, but um, you know, the next day is Monday, the day after Palm Sunday, and we see this well-known scene where Jesus enters the temple to find people making money on religion, and uh, a lot of people are familiar with this with this story where um, you know they were treating what should have been sincere worship of God into trading of pagan coin. Mm-hmm. It was. It set Jesus off. And making money off of it, like making a lot of money off of it. Yeah, they were. And it, it set Jesus off in, in a righteous anger where he flipped the tables and he drives them out of the temple. But um, And then the beautiful thing is, is that while he's upset, he's he's not like kicking the animals or overturning the dove cages. Like he's not taking it out on anything other than the money changers. Yeah, that's a good point, because there, there's a type of anger that can drive you to sin. And that's definitely, Jesus, he he knew how to um, 
to dial it in yeah. exactly where it needed to be. Well, and I love that one pastor said that this is right after the time where he comes and he can kind of overlook Jerusalem and he's lamenting over it. And he's like, oh, Jerusalem, I wish that I could have gathered you like a mother gathers her, her chicks. Yeah. And he's weeping. And there was a pastor that said before Jesus ever whipped, he wept. You know, and, and there was a, there was a thing where he just said, "I'm so sad that this is the state that my father's house is in," and yeah. it's it's very cool that he started his ministry by cleansing the temple, and now he's ending his earthly ministry by cleansing the temple. Yeah, cleaning house. Yeah. <laughs> well, and we're gonna get to why the money changers have such a, a hand in what they do um, as we talk more and more mm -hmm. about uh, the priests and everything. Yeah, that's true. So that was Monday, and then moving into Tuesday, um, Jesus he evades the Pharisees on the way to the Mount of Olives, um, where he teaches uh, parables to the people, warning against the Pharisees, those he just evaded. And um, he foretold the destruction of Herod's temple and spoke prophecies of things to come as well. And um, the next day uh, is Wednesday, and it's not recorded in the Bible, but it's believed by certain scholars that it was it was a day of rest before the Last Supper, um, which came on the following day, Thursday. Mm -hmm. And um, we all know, or most of us do, the, the famous Last Supper. There's a painting, you know. <laughs> if you don't know the story, you've seen the painting. Yeah. But, um, you know, Jesus and his disciples were in the upper room uh, where they broke bread for the last time. Mm. And it is a fascinating story because it has a lot of different elements to it where Jesus washes their feet and then yeah. some of them argue about who's the greatest in the kingdom. Yeah. And then even the identification of who the betrayer is. Yeah, that's and true. So many different aspects to that. And it's also, you know, where Jesus instituted what we now call communion or the Lord's Supper, which mm -hmm. we still practice today, often in remembrance of those very things. Yes. So there, a lot happened in that upper room. And um, they, they leave the upper room after, after they break bread and all those things happen, and they head to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus does a long night of, of prayer. And a lot happened, not just in the upper room, but leaving the upper room in this garden. Yeah. That's where things really start to ramp up. Yeah, and it's really neat that they sing a hymn as they go and they walk along to That's get right. to the garden. And then it, a lot of people call this time in the garden for Jesus, the crucifixion before the crucifixion. Oh, yeah. Because sure. as he's sitting there and he's praying, we know that the disciples have just eaten a meal. And so they're already crashing out, even though he's asked them to watch and pray. And he's he's having a moment. Yeah. And uh, there's that sad scene where he comes back and they're asleep. Mm. And, um, you know, there's a lot that can be drawn from that. But... Um, Jesus, he's still with them the whole time, even though they keep falling asleep. I don't know if they really knew the gravity of what was coming. I don't think so. I think if they did, it would have been a little different. But Jesus, I mean, I can't imagine what was going through his mind, being a, a man in the flesh, fixing to go through. And he knew what was coming. Yeah. And it's easy to judge the disciples like, man, you shouldn't have been asleep. But I, yeah. I know our flesh and I know me, oh, yeah. you know, you just ate and you're tired and you walk some and you probably be, I'd probably be falling asleep as well. Exactly. And, and not knowing the, gra like you said, the gravity of the situation of what Jesus was going through mm -hmm. uh, just a few steps away. Yeah. Yeah. And they would soon find out though, because the next thing that happens is um, someone they know, Judas shows up with 600 Roman soldiers. Yeah to arrest Jesus. that That's a lot of soldiers to come arrest a guy, don't you think? Well, somebody who's never said anything outside of like rising up or insurrection or he's not a violent criminal. Yes, I think it's a lot of soldiers. It, it, it speaks to the impact, I think, of Jesus' short ministry that he had on the people. I think they recognized how... And like you said, though, he never, he never, you know, insinuated a revolution or anything. But that's that's um, that's an interesting thing, I thought. But um, Peter, we're told in the Gospel of John at this point, in attempts, I mean, you see this this multitude of soldiers in attempt to protect Jesus. We can only imagine he he lops off the ear 
of a servant of a high priest named Malchus. And um, obviously, I think he was aiming for the head. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but the fact that he went for the servant of the high priest meant that he kind of went for the lowest man on the totem pole. He says, I think I can take that one. <laughs> yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> Not the Roman soldier armed to the teeth. Yeah. And as so many preachers, you've probably heard say he was a better fisherman than a swordsman. Yeah. And uh, we've heard a lot about that. But the Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus touches the ear of the man and he heals it. Mm -hmm. Um, I found an interesting quote by John Corson. Uh, He writes about this scene with Peter's swordplay. He says, How often we hurt one another in our attempts to protect Jesus. Ears fly everywhere, and the body of Christ is maimed because well-meaning Christians like Peter unsheathe their Bibles and start chopping away at each other. Mm. I found that. That was um, interesting to me. It's a very wild scene um, in this in this time. But, but Jesus, he makes it very clear that um, he doesn't need protection. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting that earlier in one of the gospels they were talking about do we have enough swords and he and he almost like he um face palmed himself like that's not what i was talking about at all and then when peter goes off and rashly does this he looks at peter and he goes don't you know that if you live by the sword you'll die by the sword that's that wasn't what i was asking you to do at all exactly and and he follows that up by saying don't you know i could i could call 12 legions of angels down Mm -hmm. and it's been um Guess that, or I don't know if it's guessed. I think they know about an legion is about six thousand angels. But, yeah. So we're talking about a good number of angels, and considering that one of them wiped out one hundred eighty-five thousand men in Second Kings, I mean, Jesus is making a clear point. I could easily, I could easily take care of this by force if I wanted to, Peter. One hundred eighty-five thousand overnight. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus, he's, he makes it clear, I, I'm, I'm not needing your protection, Pete. No. I'm doing this because this is, this is prophesied. This is God's will. So 72,000 angels could show up if Jesus said, hey, come on down. Exactly. But here are these 600 men to arrest him. And I love that the Gospel of John, when they come up and, you know, of course, Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss, which you have to think that part of it was the Roman soldiers wouldn't have known who he was. And and a lot of times the Gospels mention how inconspicuous he was. It's not like the paintings that we have today where, yeah. you know, he's the most beautiful man and he's got this full beard and he's white. And, yeah. Yeah, you know, exactly. all, the, all the things that like would personify him in our in our American cultural way of thinking of him. In fact, you know, Judas came up and was like rabbi and... and yeah. And then after he says, he says, I am, John tells us that every single one of them fell to the ground. Yeah. And I I even read in one commentary that uh, the Greek points that Judas was repeatedly kissing him Mm -hmm. because he was so ordinary in a crowd that they wouldn't have been able to pin pin which one he was. Yeah. Um, Of course, at that point in John, they would know exactly who he was. Mm -hmm. That's... um, Man, that would have been a scene, too. That would have been. Falling down from that statement. That's another one of those heavenly archives I can't wait to access just to see. Even though what what comes next is so tragic. Yeah. And what comes next is um, he's taken to Annas' house. Uh, Annas was at one point the high priest. And I think if we're going to talk about the next coming things, I think we need to set the groundwork just a little bit. Um, Annas was the high priest for a while. And the way that it worked, it was supposed to work, was that when a high priest um, entered that, um, that role, he would keep that role all the way until he died. But Annas was corrupt. And so he was actually removed from being the high priest by the Roman authorities. But he had an in because what had happened was the next um, five high priests were actually his four sons and then his one son-in-law, Caiaphas. Oh, wow. Well. And we mentioned the um, the money changers at the temple. Did you know that that was all their racket? Annas and his sons and son-in-law? Yeah. That they were actually the ones that ran that? Yeah. And so when Jesus came in, not only was he fronting them and, and showing them up, but he was also interrupting their business. It was like the mob. Yeah, it was basically like the mob. And that's why they were so offended at what Jesus was doing was because he was literally messing with their way of life and their authority that they believed that they had over the people. 
Um, to mention the the stuff that went on with the temple was so tragic because um, people were poor and they would bring what they felt was their best offering to to come to sacrifice to God. And so they would bring their little lamb that they've um, grown and they believed was a great sacrifice or a great offering. And then all of a sudden these these um, money changers would examine them and they'd find a blemish. Yeah. And they say, well, this sacrifice is not good enough. Of course they would. But we can sell you one, except you have to buy temple money. Yeah. And we can sell you that at a price too. So they were making money hand over fist gatekeepers at the worship of God. Exactly. Gatekeepers in the worst of ways. Yeah. And Jesus looked at that and was like, that is, that is the worst. Yeah. I mean, what would infuriate God more than actually standing in front of people worshiping him? Exactly. I love the the text that says that when um, Jesus cleansed the temple, yeah. That actually the kids of the people came in and started singing praises to God. Wow. And the priests were indignant. Yeah. Which is so tragic because they should be the ones encouraging that. Right. No kidding. And, you know, Jesus uncovering their shadiness leads them to do this whole thing that we're talking about here at night, which in itself is extremely shady. It is. It is. So, okay. So they lead Jesus to the house of Annas, which he's like, to me, he's like the godfather. And so, you know, you kind of have to like scratch your chin a little bit. And he's the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And we find out that they've already been discussing putting Jesus to death. There's a, There's been a plot in all four of the Gospels. They've all met together and plotted to kill Jesus. And one of them, we see that Caiaphas accidentally predicted that Jesus was going to be there. He prophesied that Jesus was going to be the one that died because he said, what is it that one man would die for the nation? In oh, a wow. sense. And so he actually didn't even know what he was doing, but he said this. Yeah. And so Annas comes in and it's uh we call this religious trial number one. And he's standing there all smug. And we see that um, first and foremost, he's basically asking Jesus at this point, tell us all what you're guilty of and everyone who's with you. Mm-hmm. That's what he wants to know. But we see that Jesus, in his reply, doesn't mention his disciples at all. And and in fact, he's trying to protect them in any way possible. Yeah. But what Jesus says to Annas right there is he said, I spoke openly to the world. And honestly, you guys followed me around like creepers everywhere I went. I never said anything that was in secret. It was open that I taught in synagogues and in the temple. And so um, Jesus then says, why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. And so um, Jesus isn't being uncooperative here. In fact, he's saying, hey, if this is legal, which I do that in air quotes because we know it's not. Yeah. Like, why don't you bring accusers against me? Yeah. They're trying to get him to testify against himself, basically. Yeah. And it was the high priest's duty to call witnesses first, beginning with those who were for his defense. Mm -hmm. So these basic legal protections for the accused were under Jewish law, um, and they didn't happen here in this trial of Jesus. There's so many laws that they broke. Yeah. We're going to go into all of them. But I did want to say this, that the handling of Jesus's trial by the scribes and the Pharisees may be the single most egregious example of hypocrisy on display in the Bible. Over and over, they ignored their law for their purpose and means, all while continuing to maintain a facade of holiness, breathing death through their teeth, literally through their teeth at yeah. Jesus. And they're doing it all behind behind closed doors, smoke-filled rooms, basically, totally mob style. Yeah. Because it's so illegal what they're doing at nighttime when nobody can see. No. Okay. So you just said that it's in the Talmud. It states that criminal processes can neither commence nor terminate, but during the course of the day. If a person is acquitted, the sentence may not be pronounced during that day. But if he's condemned, the sentence cannot be pronounced till the next day. But no judgment is to be executed either on the eve of the Sabbath or the eve of any festival. Mm -hmm. And the week following was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Mm -hmm. And that whole time... It's it's in that 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 time frame. Yeah, Passover, all of it. Yeah, it shouldn't. And 
Okay. So, and so they're, they're doing things out of the norm, yeah. to say lightly. Well, and let's talk about why this is at night, too. Why they came to arrest Jesus at night. They came to arrest Jesus at night because it is during the Passover, and the city is swollen. It's said that they would have up to five times the typical population in Jerusalem at that moment. And so they were doing it while everyone was asleep. Yeah. Because the people seeing Jesus arrested and then tried would yeah. have actually revolted. They would have had an uproar. Well, they were screaming Hosanna as he entered. Yeah. You know, just days before. Yeah. So they knew they had to do this on the down low. Well, and you saw that even when they said that they were plotting to kill him, they said, let's not do it during a feast, lest the people uproar. Yep. But they saw this this particular window and they're taking it. Yeah. So they're doing this. And if you're keeping track of timeline, this is like one or two in the morning, mm -hmm. maybe three. Yeah. At the latest. And so they're at Annas' house, and not only are they accusing Jesus, but now they're starting to strike him in the face. Yeah. And it says that in, um, this is all in John chapter 18. So they're starting to strike him in the face, and they're starting to bring all these um, false witnesses. And so after that, they start religious trial number two, because he's taken from the home of Annas, the godfather to now Caiaphas, who's the puppet, because mm -hmm. he's still working with his father-in-law, and I think the father-in-law is still holding the reins, but now Caiaphas is the high priest. Yeah, and just to tie in a side story here, the, at this point, uh, John entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest on this second one, but Peter, he stays behind where he's following from a distance where he's warmed by the fire. So that's what's going on is, is Jesus is entering this second trial. Yeah. And um, what happens at the second trial, Josh? Okay. On the second trial, Jesus came to the home of Caiaphas and um, it says that the scribes and elders were assembled. So he brought um, some of the Sanhedrin, if not all of them, but I don't, I don't know if necessarily it was all of them. I know that it says the whole council was at the third trial. But even the way that Josephus and Nicodemus um, kind of react to Jesus's uh, execution or his um, his judgment that they might not have been there because um, the Sanhedrin will gather at the third trial where they call it the make it legal one. Yeah, but um, well, and that's important to point out because this second one is still at night. Yes, it's still at night. That it's, third one is in the morning. Yes, it's like at the break of dawn, which yeah. is okay. So, the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus against Jesus to put him to death. But here's the thing: they found none, even though many false witnesses came forward. They found none, but at last, two false witnesses came forward and said. This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Mm -hmm. That's the ground that they're choosing to stand on. Yeah. Where Jesus said, I mean, clearly if they'd been listening to everything he's ever said, they realized that that wasn't even what he was talking about. Yeah. He's not. He's they not, took it out of context. Yeah. He's not a terrorist saying, well, I'm going to bomb the temple. Yeah. Even and though, and did, did he not make it clear to the temple built by hands? I mean, yeah. he, he was clearly, he was talking about something else, but they know they can't corner him. They never have been able to. Yeah. And we've mentioned this plenty of times, but I need to say this. This nighttime trial was illegal according to the Sanhedrin's own laws and regulations. Mm -hmm. According to Jewish law, all criminal trials must begin in the daylight. I said that before in the Talmud. Therefore, the decision to condemn Jesus was already made, and they conducted a second trial in daylight. That's the make it legal one. And so let me go over some of the illegalities of this trial. According to Jewish law, only decisions made... Um, in the official meeting place were valid. And so the fact that they're at Caiaphas's house, mm -hmm. that's not legal. Yeah. So uh, according to Jewish law, criminal cases could not be tried during the Passover season. Well, there's smack dab in the middle of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, we said this again, we'll kind of reiterate it. Only an acquittal could be issued on the day of the trial. Guilty verdicts had to wait one night to allow for feelings of mercy to arise. So um, let's say the way that it works is you were found guilty of doing something. Yeah. Um, they would have to sit on it for a day and a half or a day and a night 
to make sure that God didn't come in and speak to them and say, hey, this is what happened. This is why. It was basically a cooling off period. So nobody was just really upset about something and then acted brashly. Which is smart. They're safeguards against the sinful things that they're doing. Yeah. Um, According to Jewish law, all evidence had to be guaranteed by two witnesses who were separately examined and could not have contact with each other. None of that was done. No, not at all. Uh, Okay, so according to Jewish law, false witnesses were to be punished by death. Hmm. Like these false witnesses, they didn't do anything to them. And they hire, they basically are, these are guns for hire. Yeah, they were trying to throw anything that would stick against the wall. And of course, because they couldn't get their stories straight, nothing was sticking. Mm-hmm. But then uh, the last thing is, according to Jewish law, the trial always began by bringing forth evidence for the innocence of the accused before the evidence of guilt is offered. This is not what happened here with Jesus. They didn't ever try to argue for his innocence. Yeah. They came literally with um, not only a guilty verdict in hand, but they also came knowing what kind of sentence they wanted carried out. Yeah. And again, these were all the Sanhedrin's own rules, but it was abundantly clear that in their eagerness to get rid of Jesus, they broke them. Yeah. And the high priest basically, at this second trial, at the end of it, he he basically says, you're under oath, Jesus. You tell me, are you the Son of God? Yeah. Are you the Messiah? Yeah. And I love that Jesus at this point, I mean... Not only has he already been through the hardest part of his life going through the crucifixion before the crucifixion in the garden where he had that medical condition where he was so distraught that he actually sweat blood. Yeah. And he looked at God and he said, is there any other way? And I appreciate what that says about the gospel that, you know, we talk about, there's no other way. Your good just can't outweigh your bad. Otherwise Jesus would have been like, well, why don't we do that, God? Mm -hmm. You know, he said, no, that's not the case. He'd already had this difficult time. And now I believe in just an epic moment of courage and what our savior was like. He was like, it is what you say it is. Let's get this over with you, you bunch of hypocrites. And I'm dying for you. Yeah. And, and this and it's at this point where he puts Jesus, he says, you're under oath. You know, I, I imagine, like, you ever, like, jumped into a pool from a really high spot or something? Mm. You're just like, this is about to happen. <laughs> I imagine Jesus' emotions right here. I mean, he knew what he was fixing to do, but he knew when he said this next thing that the show was getting on the road yeah. instantly. And he says, basically, you're going to see me at the right hand of God Mm. coming on the clouds. And he knew when he said that. It was a set it off moment. He's like, you just put me under oath. Here it is. And they're, you know, they already know what they want to hear, but they're in show. They're tearing their clothes. They're tearing their robes. And they're like, oh, my gosh, it's it's a bunch of um, uh, heresy. And so when they hear this, they basically they're like, all right, we just heard the last thing we needed to hear. Mm -hmm. So in the next thing they needed to do was, like you said earlier, they needed to to legalize the illegal death sentence they issued that night. Yeah. The next morning. Yeah. In daylight. Yeah, so they call the Sanhedrin all together to make it legal, and they all look at each other like, hey, you know, I mean, everybody went home to basically change and brush their teeth or whatever, came back and like, I haven't seen you. Oh, yeah, Yeah. we're going to have the trial for this Jesus guy. Oh, okay. Oh, he's he's guilty. Yeah. You know, in a previous episode, you said that lies beget lies. And that's what we're seeing here. These religious leaders are systematically having to cover their lies through appearances. Mm -hmm. It's a show. A it giant is. show. Their sin required legality. And that sounds very familiar to what we see today. Sin being legalized. Mm-hmm. Therefore, it has its royal stamp of approval in man's eyes, but not God's. Yeah. I found this quote and I thought it was interesting. It says, Neither in the annals of the historian nor in the realm of fiction is there anything that can equal the degradation of the unholy trial, the base devices to find a charge to prefer against the prisoner, the illegal tricks to secure a verdict of guilty, which would ensure a death penalty. Hmm. They went to such lengths yeah. to find this verdict. Yeah, they really did. 
And it's from this point that they actually they head to to the airport to meet the pilot. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to. Oh, wah, wah. Yeah, yeah. We're we're meeting a man named Pilot here. Pontius Pilot. Pontius. Let's talk about Pontius Pilot real quick. Um, cause this is now we've covered three religious trials at when it was Annas and then Caiaphas and then just the Sanhedrin as a whole. And then you have Pontius Pilate who at the time is the Roman ruler over the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you know this, but he really didn't like Jews. He didn't, he, he didn't have a good relationship with them. He's not a great man. That's happened a lot through history, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that, that's actually very true. Um, he already felt like the position that he had was lowly, but he only ascended to this lowly position because of marriage. He married the granddaughter of Caesar Augustus. Yeah. And so he doesn't like Jews. Whenever he can, he actually likes to spend his time in Caesarea by the sea because at least it's not Jerusalem. Yeah. But with it being um, Passover, he had to he had to be around and he had to know what was going on. And so they the Jews, the reason that they have to get the Romans involved is they want the death penalty. Yeah. And they're not allowed to do that anymore. They're not. Yeah. It's been taken away from them, um, I think, 50 years before. Yeah. So, or 50 years before the fall of Jerusalem. And I think it's really, it's notable here. This is in John eighteen twenty eight, where it points out that they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium or palace. Um, and it was early and they themselves entered not into the praetorium because they didn't want to be defiled. It, th- this is fascinating to me. Uh, it's, well, not fascinating. I scratch my head in just awe because... They're about to commit the most egregious act of sin ever, and they're still trying to maintain this appearance of holiness. Mm-hmm. It, it, this is exactly the type of heart Jesus was addressing when he said, strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Exactly. It's insane what they're, what they're trying to look like while they're doing this. They said, we can't take take part in the Passover proclivities, the yeah. festival of it, the feast of it all. and That blows my mind. Yeah. And I like that John used this ironic touch to expose the hypocrisy of them. Oh, yeah. That for this little ceremony of defilement, they they were breaking such huge commandments because they were rejecting God's Messiah and condemning an innocent man to death. Yeah. And the crazy thing is they bring Jesus to this, this governor, Pilate, and even though he hates the Jews... He still can't find fault either. Yeah. Well, and I love what he says is he goes, well, what did you bring him for? And and you know what their answer for was? Well, we wouldn't have brought him if he wasn't a bad dude. <laughs> that's, like, that's like I asking a politician, are you for this or this? And they go, yes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it was ultimate deflection. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. And he questions Jesus. And the whole time he's going, "What? what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. And... You know, Jesus, he, he tells Pilate, he says, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Mm. And it leads to this. I don't know if you want to point anything else out, Josh, but th- this is the, the main thing that sticks out um, to me with this interaction between Pilate and Jesus. Because we hear this this famous line from Pilate where he says, what is truth? Mm. And, you know, some believe that was that was kind of a rhetorical question of sarcasm. Yeah. But... That there's so much. That's a profound question that Pilate asks. What is truth? It reminds me of so many today. You know, they're so confused, so doubtful, so close, yet so far away. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I mean, whole ministries have been started by that question. You yeah. Because he says K S Veritas, and then you have like the Truth Project that came out of that. And mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of neat things, even if it was said in sarcasm. Yeah. But he's sitting there and he's asking Jesus, "Are you the King of the Jews?" Because that actually could have a basis for insurrection. That could have a basis for uprising. Yeah. But Jesus goes, well, did you hear about that? Or did other people say that? Which yeah. is a funny thing to say because, again, he is not like full on defending himself. He's more, I think he's more filling out the heart of the issue. And mm-hmm. I think he's a lot of ways speaking to Pilate as a whole. 
Um, because, he was trying to reach Pilate yeah, as an individual. Yeah, because he goes, my kingdom's not of this world. Yeah. And even then, Pilate's going, okay, I don't understand what that means. And Jesus says, um, you say rightly that I am a king for this cause I was born and for this cause I have come to the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And that's what leads to the question, well, what is truth? Yeah. And then Pilate looks at him, and this is one of my favorite parts, as he goes, I find no fault in this man. Yeah. To which anybody that knows the law right then realizes that's an admission of innocence. Yeah. So at this point right here, yeah. Jesus should go free. Yeah. And Pilate, he, he sees the Jews aren't going to stop. At, at which point Pilate quotes, um, ain't nobody got time for this. <laughs> I'm sending this man to Herod. <laughs> well, yeah, because in the in the whole talking, he goes, uh, did I hear you say you were a Galilean or you, you had ties to Galilee? He said, that's good because I'm sending you to Herod now. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to deal with this. No. Because he already, he, he already, this is kind of, I've heard they, them say that this was going to be his third strike pilots mm-hmm. with the Jews because he, he didn't want to cause any, any more trouble with the Jews yes. in this region. Yeah. And that's kind of how they, they had a little dirt on him and they were able to dig at him by saying, you know, if you don't quelch this insurrectionist, then we're going to report you to Caesar. Mm-hmm. And it was already, they already had some, you know, the he didn't back, want to deal with that. The Jewish mafia kind of thing working. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, he said, oh, you're, I think you might be more Herod's jurisdiction. Let's, let's ship you on down the road. Yeah. Very convenient. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so that's, then that's where he goes next is Herod. Mm-hmm. And we all know that Herod treated everything like a circus. Yeah, he did. And he really wanted to see Jesus perform tricks. He'd heard great things about him. And when he came, of course, Jesus, more of the same, stood as a a lamb before it's... Led to the slaughter. Yeah, as a lamb led to the slaughter. And he kind of just didn't really do much. Yeah. And, you know, something that stuck out to me as I was reading this, the scene between Herod and Jesus, it reminded me of that scene between Jesus and the rich young ruler mm. where, it, you know, the the rich young ruler seemed to have more of a heart to discover um, the, the things that he lacked, but he and Herod both were so well taken care of in this life that they saw no reason to gain what Jesus had to offer. Yeah. And that's what, like you said, Herod treated it like a like a circus because he was he had everything, but he didn't see in front of him. That he was he was rejecting the most important thing. Yeah, and that's so sad because like Luke twenty three eight said, now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, yeah. for he had desired for a long time to see him because he'd heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. But then he questioned him with many words. But Jesus answered him nothing. And of course, the chief priests and scribes have come along with this whole parade and they're just standing there and they're just throwing accusation after accusation at him by Herod's shoulder. And and it says that Herod just and his men of war treated Jesus with contempt and they mocked him and they arrayed him with a gorgeous robe and probably started saying, you know, King of the Jews yeah. and turned him into a joke and turned him back to where he came from. Yeah. Dressed up. Yeah. Yeah. And King of the Jews, um, because of the way that Israel was at that time was almost an insult. Oh, it for sure was. You know, yeah. Yeah. They didn't they didn't consider the Jews to be much. And so to be a king of the Jewish culture, the Jewish nation, it really wasn't that special. They, yeah. they felt it more of a joke than a, than a good title. Yeah. And uh, he gets sent back now to, to Pilate. Now imagine Pilate <laughs> sitting there sipping his espresso a, 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 on his balcony. Well, yeah, and he's and probably he's already like, got a headache because he's like, this early in the morning, things are already going the sees, way they are. He sees him coming back and he's like, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> I, exactly. <laughs> you, no way this is happening again. He put a robe on him and sent him back. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and we find at this point that, of course, he brings Jesus in again. And now um, he's questioning him and he decides that he's going to have him flogged. Mm-hmm. And um, because he goes, uh, he says in Luke uh, chapter 23 again, he says, 
Um, you brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning the things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him. And indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. Which, again, is a statement of release. Yeah. And he says, I will therefore chastise him and release him. And so he says, maybe if I just give them the pound of flesh that they're asking for, yeah. because this chastisement, this beating was, was legit. Yeah. A pound it, of flesh. That sounds horrific. Yeah. It was nothing to be, it was nothing to, to, you know, be flipping about. Yeah. He, in he, Pilate, he offers them this deal. He says, I'll, I'll punish them and then I'll release them. Yeah. yeah but they weren't having that. No. They, did, they didn't want just the punishment, did they? No. And, and it was sad because there Jesus was whipped yeah. 39 times with the cat of nine tails. Yeah. And Which is, yeah, it was an insane um, thing to imagine how he, how he was punished with the, the, the blood loss. And there's so much that could be even medically looked at with what happened to Jesus next. Yeah. Before he even went to the cross. Yeah. And yet, even though Pilate introduced him and said, behold, the man in, in the state that now he's dehydrated and bloody and marred and yeah. possibly internal organs or bones exposed. Yeah. Now the Pharisees are going through the crowd. Yeah. And this is this is the type of blasphemy that they're committing um, th- that is just I have you ever have you ever seen somebody get in trouble for something that you did like in in school in elementary yeah. or something yeah you know it makes a person feel horrendous when someone else is being punished even if they got a spanking at the principal's office yeah to witness what happened to Jesus and there some of the translations I, I've read by commentators say that you couldn't even tell he was a man mm-hmm. anymore because of the mutilated flesh and blood to see a human being in that state based on lies that never even happened yeah that you spread the gossip you spread made that human being look the way they look yeah for them to continue and go on to what we'll cover in in our next episode yeah it, it makes me sick at my stomach to think that a heart could be that hardened that they could see another human being tortured that way and they had bloodlust yeah. And they were convincing the crowd to start shouting, crucify him. Yeah. The same crowd that, that was a week earlier. Yeah, that was saying Hosanna. Is now shouting, crucify him, which, you know, you could say that maybe they were even threatening to excommunicate them from worshiping in the temple. Could have been. You know, yeah, very they're well. just, yeah, they're just going through the crowd. And, and you think, again, seeing this human who was innocent, that is almost unrecognizable as a man at this point would yeah. actually cause um, some sort of sympathy. Remorse. Yeah. Anything. Anything. Instead, it's causing more of this bloodlust. Yeah. yeah. And that's the reason I used the word blasphemy because mm-hmm. they they were entering realms that that is psychopathic mm-hmm. almost. Just they let it go that far. And then you have the things going on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm where Claudia, um, Pilate's wife, is getting uh, in a dream where she comes out and says, have nothing to do with this man. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine that if the veil had been lifted to see what was going on in that realm, Satan thought he had him. He, it was about to end. Yeah. Very and, foolishly he did. And Pilate saying, I wash my hands of this. Yeah. And then the Jewish people saying, no, his blood be on our head. Yeah. Which I've always found is really ironic because that was the whole point was Jesus was saying, I want to cover you mm-hmm. with my blood so that when God looks at you, he sees me and not your righteousness. You know, the rose colored glasses of the gospel, mm-hmm. so to say. Yeah. It, it's just really tragic that that's what he had to go through in order to redeem us. Yeah. And I think this is a really good place here to stop because we're going to continue um, with our next podcast talking about the purpose of the cross. But we kind of have summed up these last events of Jesus right up until this point. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see in the next episode that the dark magic will not work against Aslan.
No, that's right. <laughs> hey, C.S. Lewis reference. I like it. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm excited about that one. But it, it's important that we look at these events to remind us of what Jesus did for us. If she had read the deeper magic. That's right. I love that. Uh, I've got goose pimples. <laughs> <laughs> you have to finish the show in a British accent. <laughs> I can't do that. You do that well. <laughs> oh, no, I don't do it well. That's the funny part. That's yeah, but it's um, yeah. That's gonna be that's gonna be a, a good one. You don't want to miss next episode too. Yeah, um, please uh, let us know what you think of this one. Yeah, we know we're kind of off book, not just doing a topic, and we really thought that during this Easter season we needed to talk about things that were relevant to the Easter message and not uh, skirt away from it because it is so important in it. And even knowing some of these details reminds me of what Jesus went through, um, that it was a quick arrest, that he shouldn't have been arrested um, overnight and then tried in the morning and then put to death that same day. I mean, that is a travesty. and, And things like that kind of tend to slip our minds when we're just reading and we're a little bit maybe more on autopilot versus... Uh, taking in what we're examining. Yeah, so true. He soaked up the harshest treatment for us so that we may be set free. And it's important that we we revisit this once a year at least. At least and dwell on what he endured for our sake. And the freedom that we have now that he did die on the cross and, Mm -hmm. and he resurrected. So we're really excited to bring next week's episode as well. And um, we'd ask that if you can share this with your friends and subscribe to the podcast, please. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, another way you can help the snake bird podcast out in a big way is give us a good rating. Cause that helps push the show out there to more people. Yes. And um, I said, hey, let us know what you think. The way that you can do that is you can connect with us. You can connect with us through Facebook. Of course, just find us on Facebook at Snakebird. Or you can um, also connect with us through our our website and send us an email. And that is uh, connect at basnakebird.com. That's the email. It's really simple. Yeah, that's right. And so... um, With that, I want to say this. Always remember, whatever you do, wherever you go, no matter what life throws at you, there's never been a better time to surrender to Jesus. And be a snake bird. bird.